So what is your name? Emily Park. And Emily, I think you're a philosopher and I think you're interested in defining the life? That's right. I'm a philosopher of science and biology and uh, I'm interested in whether we can define life and if so, how to think about the problem. How to think about the problem. Okay. And uh, are we alone? I don't know. Um, but I think our understanding of life in the sense of what we are is relevant to answering that question. Um, so it's a hard question. I don't think it's one we can say yes or no to today. So you're saying if you don't know what life is, you can't ask the question reasonably? Are we alone? Um, that might be a bit strong, but I think when we ask are we alone, the way I take that is um, not necessarily just we, but life on Earth. Is this the only case of life in the universe, or are there other cases of it out there? Well, what do you think? Um, I'd like to think that there are other cases of it out there. Why? Because it's highly improbable that life got going on Earth, but there's, you know, there's a lot of space and time out there, and um, it makes sense to test the possibility that it could have happened more than once in a different place in a different way. What, what you, the first thing you said was it's highly improbable that life got started on Earth. Um, yeah, I mean, you know... What does that mean? It means, you know, there was a series of quite complex transitions that had to take place for life to get going, and we still don't know how that happened. Um, so people researching the origin of life are learning more and more about how it could have happened and putting different pieces of the puzzle together. But it seems like quite a tricky process. Um, but it happened here, and we're learning more and more about other planets that might have features that would make them habitable. And... Uh, and it seems at least plausible that there's that it's happened more than once or that it could still be happening elsewhere in the universe. So we're trying to assess the probability of life originating on an Earth-like planet. Mm -hmm. And that could be zero, or it could be a very small epsilon, or it could be one. Mm -hmm. And you are, are of the opinion that it's very low. I don't know how to assign a number to it. You know, people like to um, talk about ways to try to assign probabilities, and I, um, I honestly don't know how to assign a number to it. But you assumed it was low. Yeah, uh, but I don't know quite how to quantify that. Where did your thoughts, the idea that it's low, come from? I think you mentioned complexity, and therefore, since it's complex, it's hard to evolve? Right, the sense that, I mean, there's obviously lots of chemistry out there in the universe, and there's a lot of steps that need to take place to get from basic chemistry to biology, wherever we draw that line, and that comes back to the what we mean by life question that we can talk more about. But uh, assuming that there is some point at which chemistry transitions to biology, it seems like the conditions for that would have to be quite special. So um, again, I don't, I don't feel like I can assign a number to it. Well, some, some biologists think it's not special at all. It happens all over the universe, and life is a cosmic imperative, and others agree with you. Mm -hmm. so, but, so you've taken a side in this debate, then? Um, yeah, to, I mean, to the extent that I... Yeah, I, I, I guess I'm kind of in between. Yeah. Okay. And um, so, uh, let me ask you again, are we alone? I don't know. You I'd don't like know. to think we're not. <laughs> okay, what part of your research can help answer the question, are we alone? Yeah, so I, um, you know, as a philosopher, I'm interested in a philosopher of science. I'm interested in particular in sort of scientific concepts and how they help drive scientific inquiry. So I've been thinking a lot recently about the problem of defining life, um, which philosophers have thought about quite a bit and which is relevant in um, a number of scientific fields with a stake in answering questions like, are we alone? Um, so I think there's a lot of different competing definitions of life out there that people have argued about, and many of them are driving the search for life in the universe in various ways. So sometimes this is based um, purely on assumptions about what life on Earth looks like and trying to find other things that look like life on Earth. But there's this quite hard problem. Um, if we're going to answer the question, are we alone, by looking for instances of life on other planets. Some people, like you said, think that there's you know, a universal biochemistry that must apply everywhere. So a reasonable strategy, if that's the case, would be to just look for other instances of that chemistry in the universe. 
Um, other people in this debate want to say that no life could have been different at the biochemical level even. So what we need is a more functional understanding of life in the sense of an understanding of life that abstracts away from the details of life as we know it on Earth and allows us to look for something that could be different in fundamental ways. I think that gets quite tricky because it makes sense in principle, but um, it's hard to know what kind of search criteria to design to look for something that's, say, um, a self-replicating evolving system that has completely different chemistry from what we're used to looking for. Okay, let's say that I gave you $100 billion to try to answer the question, are we alone? How would you use your knowledge of the, I don't know, the flexibility of the definition of life to produce specific instruments to find life? Wow, well, um, first I would get a team of scientists who know how to produce the instruments because that my expertise is not designing the exact detection efforts, but from the philosophical conceptual perspective there, um, I would say let's treat all of these ideas about what life is as a toolkit for approaching it from many different angles. So I think um, you know, in the debate about how to look for life elsewhere in the universe, some people are saying it has to be based on basic biochemistry. We need to look for certain kinds of molecules that are just like Earth molecules. Other people are saying, um, no, it has to be based on a certain kind of information processing. So let's figure out what that would look like in a way that abstracts away from things like DNA and nucleic acids. Um, I would say if we have a lot of money to design a mission rather than deciding first on one of those and designing all the instruments to address that, let's take as many as we can uh, reasonably look for with our um, chunk of money that you've given us and try to approach it from different angles. Because I think what, what life is beyond life as we know it is what many people want to get at here. And it's such a hard problem that um, I don't think it's at all clear what we should be looking for. Would any of your money be invested in SETI? Sorry, in SETI? Um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't thought as much about SETI. I think it's, um, you know, the connections between life and intelligent life are fascinating. And there, there's this whole further conceptual question of what do we mean by intelligence, which is another thing that philosophers like to argue about. Um, but the, the search for life and the search for intelligent life have this parallel structure in the sense that I talked about before of, um, we don't have a robust definition of intelligence that everyone agrees on, but we do have a set of things that we take as markers of intelligent life in our familiar um, life on Earth, namely things like, uh, well, we take ourselves humans to be intelligent life and we know what sort of traces we produce, like um, actual physical civilizations and signs of them that we can look for, technology, um, and especially we know that we produce technology that tries to look for life elsewhere. So I think, um, you know, the debate about if we find a signal coming from somewhere else of alien life trying to contact us, that would certainly be a good marker that there's intelligent life out there. But not finding such a signal isn't um, necessarily a marker that there is an intelligent life out there because we're intelligent life and we haven't successfully contacted anyone with a signal yet. So you so. think humans are intelligent? To the extent that I know what intelligent means, I think we're a case in point for it. But again, there's this issue there of um, we're trying to, at least some people are trying to define a term or um, at least characterize a term in a heuristic way to look for it, to look for instances of it. But um, are being, are our, our, our understanding of it is quite biased. Well, that's so biased that I'm wondering whether it's a tautology. You say, well, what are we? we whatever we are, we're intelligent. Right. Yeah, that's exactly the problem. And that's, that's a bit of a problem with the definition of life as well. When we try to define what life is in a way that goes beyond life as we know it, our starting point is ourselves, by which I mean not only humans, but all life on Earth. But many accounts are often quite biased towards ourselves as a starting point. So, yeah, um, it's, yeah, quite biased, if not tautological. It's quite hard to come up with a robust account of a category with only ourselves as a starting point. What does that, doesn't that mean that maybe it's not a category? Um, it could. And 
especially in the life case, I think part of the debate has come to saying, is this actually a category or not? Um, and that's, I think that's a, that's a puzzle that I'm still thinking about myself. I, my gut feeling is that it is a category that we'll find other instances of, or that we could look for other instances of coherently. But I think this problem of how do we define a category um, based on one instance of it is a very hard problem, and I, I don't have the solution to that. Um, our, our and the intelligence case in particular, um, you know, within philosophy anyway, people have argued a lot about what intelligence is and then ended up saying things like, well, rather than trying to define intelligence, we can just pick out pieces of it that are clearer to talk about, like, um, you know, consciousness or cognition, not that those are easy to characterize, but at least or memory or um, learning. So we can pick out pieces of it that are easier to study. So is an human-like intelligence a category? Um, or is it something quirky and specific? Or a, what do you call that, an individual or something? What's the opposite of a category? Yeah, you could, an individual. An individual. Um, so is human-like intelligence an individual or a category? And is life an individual or a category? Those are open questions? Yeah, they're, uh, well, hmm. The, the, life, the life is one is an open question. I don't know as much about the intelligence debate. I'm, I haven't heard someone say human intelligence is an individual, um, but... Well, species specific. Yeah, Does that sure. not mean individual? Yeah, I mean, most people talking about intelligence want it to be a, a trait that applies to things besides humans. I know they do, but yeah. then they exclude everything else on Earth. Uh, Besides I suppose you. it depends on who you ask, yes, yeah. Um, and, you know, some people want to include artificial intelligence, and some people want to think of that as more like a model or simulation of intelligence. So mm. that's where it gets quite tricky. When are we talking about an instance of the thing we're interested in as opposed to um, models or simulations or mimics of it? The $100 billion that I just gave you, would, en would you spend any of it in uh, microscopes to look for nano-aliens? Nano aliens. Nano aliens, yes. Little tiny spaceships, you know, about 10,000 molecules or something. I haven't thought about that. Um, okay, would you spend any money trying to figure out whether we are inside of an alien? Kind of like your neurons are inside of a brain and they don't know that they're inside of a brain. Could that be a possibility that you'd be interested in? Um, is that too sci-fi for you? <laughs> I mean, they're all fascinating questions. I guess the first thing that comes to mind when you offer me $100 billion is like, how can I design a research question that I'll be able to answer with that amount of money or at least get close to answering? Uh -huh. um, I mean, well, so on the nano alien point, I think if we're going to look for life elsewhere, it makes sense to start by looking for microbial life, for very small life. So as, if that's what you have in mind. No, um, I'm thinking about miniature spacecraft Okay. from um, alien civilizations. I haven't thought about that. Okay. It sounds quite sci-fi, but okay. why How about not? Being I have a inside of an alien, kind of like the Truman Show. The Truman didn't know he was inside of a show, and maybe we're inside of a giant alien or something. Yeah, or a giant simulation. It's possible. I'm I'm not sure how you would design a mission to answer that question, um, but it's a fascinating question. You do a Truman, and you sail out as far as you can. You just go as far as you can in one direction <laughs> and see where you get. But if you only have $100 billion, I'm not sure how far you could get for that, okay. but arguably not far enough to reach the end of the bubble. Okay, have you ever seen a UFO? No. Uh, what do you know about aliens? Um, what do I know about aliens? I mean, I know a bit about the sort of uh, pop sci, sci-fi aliens, um, and I know that to the best of our knowledge, if we're going to find alien life in space, it's not going to look much like the little green men, um, and probably not much like, you know, a lot of the other kinds of alien life that come up in sci-fi, but it also could. So um, you've never been abducted by aliens? It's never happened to me. Have, I wanted it very much to happen to me when I was a kid, and it never did. You wanted to be inducted by Yeah. Me. Really? Yeah. Because it would be an adventure. Yeah. It would be amazing. You wanted to be inducted by <laughs> Don't you think that's a little bit dangerous, maybe? I guess. But, I mean, in, you know, in many of the alien abduction stories, you get returned home, more or less, as you were before, maybe with different chips in your brain. But... A superhuman or something. Yeah. 
but this seems like I a fun thing to do. Wanted to be, uh, you wanted to be, I, I would not have wanted to. I don't okay. think today I would want to, but I remember that yeah. being a strong... So, so let's talk about the aspects of life. Since you're interested in defining life, some people say you shouldn't define life because, or, or Nietzsche said, I think, uh, to paraphrase him, anything that has evolved cannot have a definition. Mm. Because essentially because it's changing and has changed over time and therefore to say I want to define something that's changing is kind of like saying okay I want the river is the way the exact water molecules are but the river is always these molecules moving past yeah so tell me about that tell me about the definition of life and how you view that critique of it yeah so um philosophers love to argue about what we mean by terms and here we can argue about what we mean by definition so I, th I think there's some truth in, in what you just said. And uh, what many people mean by definition is coming up with what we would call a strict definition. So a set of uh, individually necessary and jointly sufficient conditions for um, a term, in this case, a class of things, life. And many people, uh, including myself, have thought that's kind of a problematic approach because it means you're trying to just draw a really clear line around something that might uh, not be amenable to such a category. And the evolutionary point you mentioned is one. Um, so when I think of defining life, I think of it in the sense of how is it productive for the sciences that actually care about it. To me, that's the more interesting question than um, you know, how could I or anyone as a philosopher sit in our armchair and scratch our heads and come up with a definition of life. I think, um, especially, you know, astrobiology looking for life in the solar system, but also synthetic biology trying to create life in the lab or asking about the origin of life on Earth. Those are all cases where there are good reasons for scientists to care about uh, what I would call a looser definition of life in the sense of um, a working or operational characterization of life. So it's a definition in the sense that you're trying to specify what something is as a way to guide your inquiry about that something. But that kind of definition, as I understand it, can be open to modification over time. Um, just like any other good scientific theorizing, you, you try to specify what you think something is, and as your knowledge changes over time, it's open to modification. Um, and in the case of life, like you said, life is evolving. So we definitely wouldn't want to say, um, OK, I'm going to define life on Earth. Life is. Uh, you know, Homo sapiens plus E. coli plus a list of all the other species. That would just be to say, um, what life is there when I look around today? And it wouldn't apply to life 10 million years ago. So the part of the trick here is um, even assuming that we can define life in the looser sense that I talked about that I think is more relevant to scientific practice definitions. It's still, you don't want to be so specific that you're just picking out the things that we think are living when we look around. But again, it's hard to be broad enough to capture alien life because that's life as we don't know it. In the question, are we alone, what does the word we mean to you? I take it to mean life on Earth. All of life on Earth? Yeah. Including viruses? Um, yeah, I mean... Including cities, ecosystems, I think of those as all part of the phenomena of life on Earth. So yeah, li life on Earth and the artifacts and phenomena it creates. Okay. Now, in what sense is the search for life analogous to, let's say, McCarthyism in the 1950s, the search for communists in America? Hmm. Can you say more what you mean by that? Well, he was looking for something. He was afraid of something, I guess. And he was, yeah. he was trying to, oh, he's a communist. And you'd have to look for, how do you define a communist? And so people were saying, well, I have sympathy. You're a communist sympathizer. So there's a whole gray area of political spectrum between right. everything and everything. So um, I'm wondering mm -hmm. if that has any, is that a disanalogy, <laughs> I think, or an analogy? Or? Uh, well, I mean, it's a disanalogy in the sense that there's a very different uh, it's not politically charged in the same way. Uh, Looking for life elsewhere is not politically charged. Not in the same way. I mean, it might be politically driven, you know, one, one government wants to get there first and that sort of thing, but I think it's quite different from the McCarthyism case. One sense in which it might be similar is, um, is there's, there's this characterization of life that I've heard people call the pornography definition in reference to 
um, a US judge who ruled in a case, I can't define pornography, but I know it when I see it. Um, something like that is sometimes in the background in the search for life, I think. It's, um, you know, okay, there's all these definitions out there, metabolism, evolution, uh, particular biochemistry, but really we'll know it when we see it. Okay. And uh, I think at least some of that applied in the communism case as well, that kind of thinking. We don't have a definition of it, but uh, with my own biases, I'll know it when I see it. So that's at least a loose analogy perhaps in the structure of the reasoning. Some astronomers are convinced that once you have life, you have intelligent life. Once you have intelligent life, you have technological life. Mm -hmm. And then you have, then you build spacecraft and take over, colonize the galaxy. Mm -hmm. And when you do the time frame there, it only takes like a million years or so to colonize the entire galaxy, moving at about a tenth the speed of light. Now, and Fermi was thinking about this, and mm -hmm. he said, "Where is everybody?" Yeah. And since then, this has become known as Fermi's paradox. Do you have a solution to Fermi's paradox? No, I don't. But when. When I've heard people talk about Fermi's paradox, I often get the sense that they're making assumptions about probabilities that uh, can't necessarily be quantified easily. Um, so I'm no expert in Fermi's paradox, but I've never seen a version of it that filled in a specific probability for each of the steps in question. And I think that that would be needed to really make the point. Um, I mean, it's certainly an interesting conceptual point that once you have life, you get intelligent life. Uh, that's what happened on Earth, assuming that you know we're at least one example of intelligent life. But the claim that, that, that there's some necessity to that happening everywhere um, is interesting, but I'm not convinced of it. So it, you know, it, makes, it makes sense to me that life could get going on another planet and be um, quite simple microbial life, the way life looked on Earth you know, three billion years ago and stay like that indefinitely. I, do, I don't see why uh, necessarily it should go in the intelligent direction. Well, there are two very important assumptions that produce this paradox. Mm -hmm. One is that life gets started and then mm -hmm. once you have life, you have intelligent life and technological life. So of those two assumptions, which do you find the least compelling? Which do you have the most skepticism about? Hmm. Or just Honestly, <laughs> yeah, I, I, my, my, yeah, I just, I don't feel like I'm in a position to assign a probability to either of those. I feel like to answer the question of how skeptical I am, I would want to attach, to quantify the, the possibilities. And uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I don't want to just wave my hands and say, oh, I'm more skeptical about this because okay. of some background intuition. Okay. Yeah. Although that's what you did earlier when you said the probability of, of life forming is low. Yeah, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, one definition of Gerald Joyce and NASA is like a, a, Dar a chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. And, I mean, once you get Darwinian evolution going, it can produce eyeballs and hands and, you know, human beings and technology, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you get something like that going? How does Darwinism start? How do you bootstrap that? I mean, because that's what you have to do in order to... You, talk about, you can talk about the evolution of Darwinian that evolution, right? So do you have a view on that? Like Carl Woese has some views on this. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, but you might have some views. Yeah, I, I think it, I mean, it's an incredibly hard problem. Um, but, you know, I know a lot of people think that you need some kind of replicating molecule first. And then the big question is, how do we get to that? Um, mm -hmm. From quite simple chemistry. All right. Um, now there's a there's an idea in astrobiology that says, how are we going to figure out what kind of life we should expect elsewhere? Mm -hmm. And people look around at the biology on Earth and say, what has, what has evolved independently multiple times? And then if, it, if we can find out that something has evolved independently multiple times, that becomes our best candidate for what we should expect elsewhere. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that logic? Um, I mean, again, it's there's a sense in which that kind of logic is quite biased to ourselves in the sense of life on Earth. So this has happened multiple times here, therefore it would happen multiple times elsewhere. Um, I'm not sure we can necessarily assume that, although again, 
there's an argument for thinking it might raise the probability, again, in a way that's hard to quantify. But so something like multicellularity, for example, if that had only evolved on Earth one time, um, it would seem more special uh, in a way than, than the actual case, was, which is that it evolved something like, I'm forgetting, 22 or 25 times um, in separate lineages. You're ignoring the word independently that I put in there. Independently. You said if they evolved multiple times. Yeah. And, but I mean multiple times independently. Yeah. And that, that's the criterion, right? Right. So, and do you think there's good evidence that multicellularity evolved independently multiple times? That's my understanding, yeah. But you know that all life on Earth is, has a common origin. Yeah. So none of it's independent from each other. Sure, but w within the tree of life, so to speak, there are separate occasions on which multicellularity has evolved. Separate occasions from a very from related origins. Sure. Okay. So if you're asking about completely separate origins of life. Well, independent. Yes, completely. You could put the word completely in there, but I, I thought that. Was okay. Cool. I was. I wasn't talking about. Yeah, I was talking about multicellularity evolving, independent times after the origin of life. So you're asking about independent origins of life. Well, they're all eukaryotic, I think, all the examples of multicellularity. Mm -hmm. So they have a common ancestor that's eukaryotic. So that puts a lot of commonality in non-independence. But why does that make them non-independent? Because they're the same. They, they have the same ancestor. Right, but they were is there. They have the same answers, yes, and, and also a lot of the same things that evolved for, I guess, two billion years, they were identical. Mm -hmm. So if you evolve, they're identical for two billion years, and then they diverge, and then they produce multicellularity, then you could say that a lot of the necessary prerequisites for that were, in, were shared by all of them. I'm arguing for non-independence of what is often termed independent evolution. Okay, so I guess, yeah, I guess you have a stronger sense of independence from what I was starting with. Um. So let's to, to take that apart. Why, why would, uh, I thought independence is a word that, in, in a mathematical sense, it's, I guess it's not strong or weak, it's just, it has, it means independent. Like flips of a coin. Sure. Is that strong independence? So I, I was thinking of independent in the sense of, uh, you have a unicellular lineage, more than once, uh, on separate occasions, unicellular lineages have become multicellular. Okay, so once you become, well, if a lineage divides into two, mm -hmm. as soon as it divides into two, then they're independent. Mm -hmm. And anything they produce is independent. I was thinking of it in that sense. You're thinking okay. of it in a different sense. Right, right. Yeah. Well, that's right. So that, but that is an interesting point because it depends. It, it, at least this is a very important issue for astrobiologists. Mm. Okay, now if we replay the tape of life on Earth, let's do this experiment that Stephen Jay Gould is known mm -hmm. for thinking about. He replayed it back to, I think, pre-Cambrian times. But let's replay it <coughs> back to, I don't know, let's go back four and a half billion years. The Earth just formed, the lava just cooled down. Do you think life would evolve again on Earth? I don't know. Okay, um, okay like, let's I, put life on, let's go, let's turn back only to Let's say 500, let's do pre-Cambrian. Mm -hmm. Turn back to the pre-Cambrian. Do you think anything like humans would evolve again? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think there's a lot of Pull and Gould's reasoning for um, the steps of evolution being quite contingent. I don't know how to answer that without actually doing the experiment. Um, well, one way to say it is that uh, if you had an infinite number of possibilities and one path is taken, then the probability is zero. Mm -hmm. But if you have like a finite number of probabilities and the selection landscape is very well carved out, then you're going to form something like humans every time. Yeah. And there's a debate in the community about those two, I guess, end members. Yeah. Do you have a stance on that debate? Yeah. I mean, my sense is that it's in between. But again, you're asking <laughs> me to assign probabilities where I'm not sure I can. Okay. Um, uh what kind of aliens would you wanted to be abducted as a child? I, I, that's, I find that incredibly interesting. What, but today, as an adult, what kind of aliens would you like to find? Or would you like to be abducted by? Oh, well, separate questions, right? Because there's a sci-fi scenario. I mean, you know, the alien abduction scenario is always intelligent, 
something like humanoid aliens. Um, I think, what would I like to find versus what do I think we'll find? I mean, it would be amazing. Would be like, I'm, like, I'm talking emotional, Emily, here. Okay, I'm, okay, so not, not rational. Rationality out the window. Emotional, please give me a... Okay, so, so I mean, setting aside the microbial life, which I think is what it's much more likely that we would actually find, it would be amazing to find alien civilizations that are um, advanced and macroscopic and interactive and uh, intelligent, however we understand that. Um, yeah. Some people accuse city people of looking for God. Hmm. And so what, what kind of alien do I want to find? I want to find omniscient, very beneficial, and somebody's not going to kill me, and that's going to help us solve all our problems. That sounds a little like God. What do you think of that accusation? I, I haven't heard that one before, but it makes sense. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I can understand that being part of what's driving some people's interest in SETI, but you know, it's a hard enough problem. How would we look for microbial life in space that's like microbial life on Earth? It's an even harder conceptual and empirical problem. How do we look for an intelligent life? And I don't even know how to touch the problem of how do we look for an omniscient being. Um, yeah, I mean, when, when I think about how this would work, I think of how, what sorts of conceptual tools and empirical tools could we take into space to, uh, to look for this sort of thing. And I, you know, there's no omniscience detector. Um, I'm not sure how that would work. Okay, now about half the people I've talked to have said that if we find microbial life somewhere, that they will still be alone. We will still be alone. Hmm. In other words, they can only answer the question, are we alone, if we find something that we can talk to and communicate with. That's kind of like what the word alone refers to. So if you're in a room and there's tons of bacteria, you're alone in the room. That's something I think we can all identify with, but as a scientist, we can all say, well, that's not true because there's all kinds of life forms. But what do you think of that? I mean, this is half the population who are probably listening to this video think that we will still be alone if we discover microbes on Mars or Enceladus or Europa, et cetera. Yeah, see, I, I, don't, I don't share that view. I, uh, I, inter I interpreted are we alone to refer to all of life on Earth. And we humans are a tiny, tiny, tiny subset of all life on Earth um, in you know, numbers and in history. So... Um, so I, think, I think it would be amazing to find microbial life, and obviously we can't talk to microbes, but for me what's interesting, what's especially interesting about the search for life, setting aside you know, how cool it would be to find aliens to chat with, is just, um, did this amazing life thing happen more than once? Well, Nick Bostrom thinks if we find life independently or evolved life on Mars, that that would be the worst news ever published, because that means that since the fair, since we haven't been colonized by aliens, that means that life does not evolve into galaxy colonizing things. But if we find independently evolved life, then that means the bottleneck that answers the question, that's the Fermi paradox, is not the origin of life, but that everything self-destructs when it gets bombs powerful enough to do that. Mm -hmm. You share that if, if we find independently evolved life on Mars, would you think that's the worst news ever? No. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, like I, I, I know that's a line of reasoning and we can't rule it out, but I don't think that, I don't think that you can infer self-destruction from finding microbes elsewhere. I mean, another explanation for finding microbial life elsewhere is that life has gotten going elsewhere and it's uh, reached a state, you know, I don't, I don't like using the word complexity, but it's, it's reached a stage, you know, a size and uh, spread on a planet that's roughly where ours was three billion years ago. So instead of saying self-destruction would then be the answer to Fermi paradox, you would say the inability or the low probability of producing universe exploring technology would be the bottleneck. Sure. Um, but, and also, yeah, I, I just, if we find microbial life on one other planet, say, um, I, I've heard people suggest that that dramatically changes the numbers in the Fermi paradox. I don't know how to understand whether it does or not without seeing all the numbers. Okay. And is the, is the question, are we alone, 
an important question? I think it's a deeply interesting question. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's, there's a sense, a lot of people want to say that if we find a so-called second sample of life, life that originated from a totally different origin, we'll learn something really deep about the phenomenon of life in general. I'm attracted to that view, but I don't have a good argument for it. Um, I think it's, it's appealing and um, we'd have to get there to see what we learn. In particular, um, finding life, finding microbial life on another planet doesn't necessarily mean that life's originated more than once, right? It could, um, you know, th there are theories like, the, you know, life arriving, arriving on a meteor and so forth. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily the case that finding life elsewhere means that it's originated more than once, but finding out that it did, I think, would be a pretty amazing discovery. Um, and of course, presumably, if we interpret are we alone in the sense that you said many other people you've interviewed have, you know, if we, if we were to find out that we're not alone in the sense of there are other intelligent beings out there sending spacecraft out looking for us, um, I think it's, it's even more plausible that that would teach us something quite amazing and what it is is to be determined. Okay, now astrobiologists seem to be creating a scientific version of Genesis, or the story of how we got here. Now, they're getting some pushback from people who have religious views on this. Uh, do you think this scientific, what do you think of this creation of a scientific story of Genesis? Is this something that you think is the most valuable thing we've ever created, or do you think this is just something that is like another religion, or do you think that do you think this is important, or how important is this? How important is the, 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 the Genesis The production argument? of the scientific view of Genesis that seems in many places to be replacing the religious view of the origin of humanity. Um, I think it's very important insofar as I am not religious and care about a scientific worldview. Um, so you have a scientific worldview on this, and so you're always, hey, let's go, let's find out scientifically how we got here. Yeah. Even if it undermines our self-importance. Yeah. And the more it undermines the self-importance, the better it is. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think we're that important um, in, in the sense that you're talking about. I mean, I have a sense of self-importance in everyday life, but you're talking about something different, which is uh, hum humans being some kind of special endpoint. Um, I don't hold that view at all. I don't think we're, you know... But isn't that a, a, just a more a larger scale version of this, of your self-importance? Mm. You said you're comfortable no. with feeling that you are important, but no. you're less comfortable with thinking that humans, homo sapiens are important? When I said I have a sense of self-importance, uh, I, you know, I was referring to the more kind of social, cultural, psychological. But you're willing uh, to do a lot to preserve the bag of water that you are. Yeah, sure. Because you think it's important. Yeah, but I think that's entirely consistent with thinking that you know, the human species is just a tiny blip in the history of life on Earth. And so you're a tiny blip too, and it doesn't. Yeah, okay. absolutely. I don't. I don't think that. Uh, yeah, fr from a scientific viewpoint, I don't think that. You know, we sh that it's reasonable to think that we're the center or the endpoint of anything. So. But you're I'm, worth protecting, and humans are worth protecting. I guess. Um, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't really see the incompatibility. Um, well, I guess, for example, if we find bacteria on Mars, are we going to terraform Mars or are we not going to terraform Mars? Are we going to leave it as a preserve or are we not? Or uh, E.O. Wilson has, has pro proposed that we reserve half of the Earth for, be, for wild. And other people say, no, no, I got to have children and people are more, much more important than those trees and insects that he's trying to preserve. So do you, do you have a, a, a horse in that race? Right, so yeah, <coughs> those are trickier ethical questions, and there it's, uh, yeah, that's where the two issues come together. Um, I don't know, I think it's really hard. I mean, we, we already, that gets into these questions about, you know, do our ethical duties to other living beings extend to um, only other humans or sentient things or all of nature, including microbes? Um, you know, so the view that everything alive deserves our respect 
is appealing in some ways, but we already undermine that all the time when we take antibiotics and eat <laughs> and all these other things. So, um, but the, yeah, the question of should we terraform other planets is quite tricky and I'm not sure where I stand on that. Um, okay, how about the, now Stephen Hawking has thought that he thinks because the Earth and the Sun are relatively young, and we know that there are many, many, many Earth-like planets that, evolved, that were formed on average two billion years earlier than our Earth. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of time for biological evolution. He and many others think that there are alien civilizations elsewhere. They don't, under, they don't have a necessarily a solution for Fermi's paradox, but they think we should keep our head down in the sense that we shouldn't explicitly send messages out to aliens. Here we are, aliens, uh, you know, this is what we do. Mm -hmm. What do you, you have a view on that? Um, I mean, I think it's fascinating to think about, but it's it's a lot. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it's a very There's... practical issue right now. Should we broadcast or only listen? Some people think we shouldn't even listen because if we listen, we'll hear messages that will uh, under that will destroy us. Yeah, I don't. I don't see why we should assume that. Um, I'm not. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to speculate about whether alien civilizations would be friendly or hostile and so forth. But, I mean, backing up the prior question is how do we listen and what messages could we send? And um, I guess for me, the interesting starting point is to better work that out. And then perhaps as part of that, we should think about should we do it or not. Um, but, I, yeah, I personally don't see why we shouldn't. It seems like there's these fascinating questions to answer. It would be really bad if we broadcast a message and someone came and wiped us out as a result, I suppose. Well, well the, 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 but, argu the argument of these people is that, hey, look at human history. That's obvious what happens. When, in human history. In human history, when advanced technological civilization comes into contact with the less advanced one, poof, genocide, ethnic cleansing. And so yeah. if... That they happen again and again and again, multiple times on Earth. So if, if that seems to be a model, mm -hmm. or maybe the best model we have, and therefore, hey, do not even listen. <laughs> yeah, so that's an argument. But again, like it comes back to this question of we're taking what we're familiar with as a model for um, searching for something in the universe that, at least in principle, we want to be quite different, or we want to allow for being quite different. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have a solution to that, but I think... I guess as a broader point in answer to many of these questions, I just want to exercise caution in taking ourselves, humans or life on earth, depending on the question, as the starting point and assuming that we can just extrapolate from that to the rest of the universe. Um, I don't have an answer to the question of what will it look like if it doesn't look like us, but I don't think assuming it will look and act like us in all the, th the ways that we think are salient is necessarily the best starting point. So should we or should we not broadcast? Um, I want to say we should off the top of my head, but only because I think it would be really amazing to see what we could you learn. Want to be abducted. Yeah, I mean, it all comes back to that. That's no, interesting. But I, I also understand the ethical issues there, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, it's worth being cautious, I suppose. I, I just think uh, if we could figure out a way to broadcast that and, and to listen, um, I think it's a fascinating project. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's talk uh, one a little bit before we let's talk about the definition of life again. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the definitions of life that you think are operationally useful that astrobiologists should keep in mind? Um, so there's, I mean, again, I think an approach to that is to think of a sort of a set of them as operationally useful together. So. Um, you know, Stephen Benner's proposed this idea that uh, we should look for certain kinds of molecules called polyelectrolytes, which um, are a broader class that contains DNA, but also other molecules. Um, that seems like one promising route to give us something concrete to look for. I, Another, asked, I asked Steve that question, are there any other molecules, polyelectrolytes, yeah. that are not associated with life on Earth? And he kind of, and then somebody else was, of course, Steve, there are many, many, many. Mm -hmm. So that kind of undermined the uniqueness of what you could look for. Mm. At but least, if, I'm not a biochemist, but some biochemists told me, told the whole audience that, yes, there are many like polyelectrolytes that are not associated with biology. Yeah, okay. So I'm not a biochemist either, but it, and again, you know, I'm not, 
I'm not going to try to say exactly how you would design the instruments, but it seems like um, looking for a particular class of molecule seems like something that it might be easier to design a way to do than looking for evolution. Right. Um, because, you know, we have our own recipe for evolution, but, uh, you know, it's, it's not as obvious to me how to design a research program looking for evolution. So I think taking to the extent that we have these well worked out ideas of what sorts of molecules could we look for, mm -hmm. that seems like a good starting point. Um, but I also don't think there's anything wrong with um, the more sort of functional approach, like let's look for evidence of things like self-replicating molecules or metabolism, um, and then triangulating that with what astrobiologists are already doing, which is looking for things that look like um, Earth life. You know, we have, we have evidence in the fossil record of really, really, really old structures that the early microbes on Earth left. Um, let's look for those on other Earth. I'm sorry, let's look for those on other planets. As long as, um, as long as it's clearly understood what we're doing there, which is assuming that life on Earth is a good starting point for looking for life elsewhere. When I asked you the question, are we alone, or what does we mean, you seem to be rather agnostic about, I think you said all life on Earth. Now, life on Earth can be carved up into, well, DNA. Some people think DNA is life on Earth. Or what the unit of selection is. Is it DNA, or is it a chromosome, a bunch of genes, or is it a single cell, or is it a multicellular organism, or is it an ecosystem, or even Gaia at the largest scale. The whole mm. Earth is alive. Now, you, for your view of are we alone, that you think that that's that distinction between the target of selection or unit of selection is irrelevant and that you're perfectly happy with calling Gaia alive or DNA alive and that uh, the, our we alone <coughs> include, the we includes any scale of that, that scale of those, that varying size of life on Earth? Um, yeah, I mean, part of what I have in mind with, you know, using different definitions of life to triangulate the search for life elsewhere is Right, like you said, some accounts treat life as a feature that individual things like cells and organisms have. Other accounts treat life as a feature at the planetary level. Um, I think thinking of both of those at once is a good way to look for life elsewhere. And similarly, uh, the way I understood Are We Alone, I took it to be life on Earth and its phenomena. Um, so, yeah, I... I would consider, you know, if we found evidence at the planetary level of a biosphere elsewhere, of a whole collective of, or of organisms changing the structure of a planet, I think that would be answering the question, are we alone just as well as discovering a single organism? In both cases, we've discovered living things and their phenomena, or at least one. What if the whole biosphere was analogous to the biosphere on Earth, but the individual parts of it were very, very different? I mean, for example, maybe it was a biosphere based only on RNA world, and then it skipped the whole, you know, organism level and multicellularity, and it was just an RNA world and the biosphere created by cooperating RNA entities. Mm. Now, I guess then in that case, wouldn't you say Gaia is not alone, but mammals are? Interesting, yeah. Um... I mean, sure, if by alone you mean we have, I, I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't thinking of the question in terms of needing to discover an analog for every piece of the living world and its phenomena on Earth. So what you're suggesting is uh, if we find life elsewhere, but it doesn't include an analog to, you know, microbes and plants and mammals and humans, then we're still alone. I don't think of it that way. I think if we found life of any sort, it would suggest to me that we're not alone. And if we found an RNA world on another planet, um, you know, in my mind, that's a transitional stage between life and non-life. So it would suggest to me, or, you know, an early stage of the origin of life, it would suggest to me that we're not alone. Um, life is getting going elsewhere. Or, you know, if it's been around for a long time, well, life some, got going. I think some people like Richard Dawkins would, would argue that we're still living in an RNA or DNA world. Mm that you know, these organisms are just you know, the fluff, the castles built by some DNA. Some DNA builds organisms and other DNA just floats around. Sure, yeah. Although that, I mean, I think you're, you're talking about two related but different questions. One is which sorts of entities exist 
here or elsewhere? And a separate question is, what are the fundamental units of selection? Hmm. So oh. Dawkins doesn't deny that there are humans and plants and no, animals. He just doesn't it. think they're the important units of selection. That's right. That's yeah. Right. Okay, so uh, what do you think of the students who think about it, are we alone in astrobiology, what do you think their biggest misconceptions are about this field? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> not having talked to them, I'm not sure. Misconceptions. I mean, I guess... Um... Or how about the public? Mm. You know, you've talked to the public about the yeah. question, are we alone? And you've run into some ideas that make sense to you and other ideas that make no sense whatsoever. Which are the ones that don't make any sense to you that are fairly widespread? Yeah, I mean, what, one common one is that if, if we're going to find life elsewhere, it's going to be little green men or something like that. You know, this idea that um, the most interesting and important life on Earth is stuff like us. So if we're going to look for life elsewhere or successfully find it, it should look something like us. Um, or, you know, something like the sci-fi aliens that are vaguely humanoid looking. Um, but the job of Hollywood is to tell us, I guess, what we want to hear rather than yeah. what is realistic. Well, and sure, that, that would be fascinating to hear. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think when, when we talk about life on Earth or, um, you know, like when I teach philosophy of biology, my students are often quite surprised to learn how... It relatively insignificant human life is as far as how long it's been around on earth and um, how much of the so-called tree of life it occupies. Um, so just the idea that microbes are hugely important and we should probably start the search there I think is surprising for some people. Now have you seen the movie Contact? Yeah, Jodie Foster? Jody Foster, yeah. Now several times in that movie they said somebody naively asks, are we alone? And the answer comes back, well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space. So what do you think of that? Waste of space. That's what it said. Yeah. <laughs> Three times. Sure. <laughs> once um, when she's in bed with the guy at Arecibo, <laughs> once in the very beginning that her, her father answers, right. and once at the end when a little 10-year-old girl comes up, to, or 10-year-old boy or something, says, are we alone? And she says, Oh, well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space. Okay. I think that's very close to the end of the, the well, movie. Well, you've clearly seen it more times than I have. Yeah, I suppose, I mean, it's, you know, getting back to this intuition that uh, life must have gotten going many, many times. What's, what's the point of having all these planets and chemistry if they're not going to give rise to biology? I think putting it that way presupposes that there's some higher purpose in some sense, which, um, which, I, which I disagree with. Um, so yeah, I think I think that sort of comment comes from a place of wanting there to be some kind of higher meaning and order to things. Um, and again, not not knowing the probabilities, I don't know how to say how much of that space could have life on it and how much doesn't. But yeah, I think of that as a as a scientific question. I think they're coming at it from the point they're SETI searchers, so they're looking yeah. for intelligent life. And so if there's no intelligent life, then it's a waste of space. I think that's more or less the, the background. Sure. So it's, I mean, I guess from the perspective of us and any other intelligent life out there that cares about such questions, it might be a waste of space. But, uh, but you know, I'm not sure the microbes care. Well, I, I'm, I'm fairly upset by that comment. It reminds me of Captain Cook and the English when they came to Australia and said, hey, terra nullis. It's a waste of space because there are no civilized Europeans who yeah. are farming here. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and so you would agree with my contempt and vilification of that comment? <laughs> yeah, it just seems like a quite self-focused way to look at it. Where, where self means human-like intelligence, yeah. not biology. Yeah. You're more susceptible to believe if there's no life of any kind than it's a waste of space. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but from the intelligence perspective. Okay. Now, Arthur C. Clarke said that uh, any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from magic. And, uh, but then there's this, a German guy, Carl Schroeder, who said, no, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature. And the idea is that when you get really advanced, you don't 
cut down forests, you are you're living in, I don't know, together with a forest and, and what you do is compatible, you're recycling, you're part of nature, not you know, battling nature and fighting it and destroying it. What do you think of that? I mean, it sounds like different understandings of advanced. I mean, look at what we've done on Earth, you know, in... That's right, we've if, destroyed a lot of it, and so that would be we've destroyed Clark, a lot of it. the idea is, what, but if you're really advanced, you get away from that destruction and you start to become more compatible and hugging trees and... Sure, so that's, that's understanding advanced uh, in some sort of morally weighted sense, you know, of... Uh, Recycling is advanced. <laughs> well, sure. Uh, or, you know, I, th I think in, on that understanding of advanced, there's some sort of normative aspect to it, not just meaning developing lots of fancy, complicated technology, but meaning developing fancy, complicated technology and having the wisdom to, uh, you know, act responsibly and preserve the environment accordingly. Um, so I certainly agree that we should be, you know, building less smoky, destructive, polluting things and... Uh, trying to preserve preserve the natural environment more, um, but yeah, the 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 way you frame that, it just sounds like two different ways to talk about advanced. So it's perfectly plausible that there could be advanced civilizations out there that don't, you know, give a darn about the environment and are polluting and building all sorts of technology, and other advanced and responsible civilizations that are doing the other thing. So you entertain the idea of advanced civilizations being a possibility elsewhere? Sure. I'm not going to say it's impossible. <laughs> okay. Do you have any advice for students who are thinking about becoming astrobiologists? Wow. Um, I mean, I guess as a philosopher and someone who's really interested in interdisciplinarity, um, I think it's interesting if you want to get into these fields to try to study the questions from as many angles as possible. Um, so one thing at the University of Auckland, we're starting this new center for fundamental inquiry that has people from a number of fields and sciences interested in astrobiology and origins in various ways, um, as well as myself and hopefully soon more philosophers. And we're trying to encourage this um, as broad as possible engagement with the questions at stake. So if we're interested in looking for life on other planets, not just uh, figuring out how to design the spaceships and the instruments, but pushing the questions like, what is life anyway? And what are we looking for? And you know, how have people debated and understood that term? And how is it relevant? Um, I think if you're thinking about getting into an already scientifically interdisciplinary field, uh, I encourage people to think about the philosophy as well. So you think that philosophers definitely have something to contribute to astrobiology? I hope so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and um, are we alone? I hope not. I don't know. It remains why, why to be determined. Why, why would you have a hope there? Because I just think it would be fascinating to discover that we're not. Because you expect to, to find out more about the universe if we... You want life to exist elsewhere. Yeah. Do you want Emily Parker to exist elsewhere? Do you want to find another Emily? Would that be That's a scary prospect. Um, oh, wait, 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 but there's a certain analogy between finding other life and finding another you. Yeah. But one I think, you find very interesting and it's wonderful, and the other you find, ooh, that's frightening. <laughs> so what, what's the difference there? Are you um, worse, in some sense, are you a worse kind than life? Wow. Well, yeah, I think you're pushing me to shift from thinking of it in terms of could there have been separate origins of life, which was how I'm thinking about it, to like, could there be a parallel universe that contains an, or a parallel, you know, well, another world that no, contains an analog. A separate origin of or Emily Parker or, or a separate origin of life. I'm just putting those in the same category. Yeah. Um, I haven't thought about finding an analog of myself. I think it would be quite scary and it would suggest... Um, you know, all sorts of differences in the probability assessments about life. You but know. finding an analog of life, you think it would be really interesting. Finding an analog of you is quite scary. That's my initial reaction, yeah. Why is that? 
I wouldn't want to talk to another Emily on another planet. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, no. I mean, it would. But you want to talk to other life. So, though. yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess it depends on what exactly you mean. But it, it would suggest some kind of much stranger sci-fi type scenario in which um, not only did evolution get going, but it took exactly, exactly the road that it took here down to the individual details of another me being but alive life, today. But if life is not a kind and it is an individual, then that puts them on the same ground, seems to me. You, you mean there's another individual instance of life that's gone, or there's another individual trajectory that's gone exactly like ours? Or, 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 or there is just life, and it's not necessarily exactly. I mean, the other Emily might have, might be a different, different political opinion or something. <laughs> might be a, sure. She might be a biochemist or something. Sure. I mean, it's, you know, it's an interesting, an interesting thought experiment. Um, here I'm back to wanting to say it's highly improbable without being able to assign a number to it. Um, I don't know how improbable it is, but I was <laughs> curious about the different emotional reactions. One was frightening and the other was, yeah, bring it on. Yeah, that's my reaction. <laughs> okay.